12 tribes compound in Vermont was raided by local authorities. More than 100 children were taken into protective custody. The state feared the children were being badly beaten as part of the strict discipline imposed by church parents. And that's just what the state is trying to do, prosecute if there is evidence of child abuse. We were told as children that based on our religious rights that the government had no business being there and taking the children, and that's why they were returned. However, it wasn't that it was unconstitutional, it's that they just couldn't get the right information together to make it legal because they didn't have warrants for every child and with their legal name on it. How to do in the no birth records and right, but records nobody of any kind. knows whose name is who. Everyone goes by one Hebrew name that's given to them when they join the community. No one knows legal names, and we moved we moved around so much that there was never a legal address. It's common with these groups. Outside officials are, in many cases, enemies of Satan, and they're out to destroy God's work. So lying to an outside official is acceptable if the lie is in the context of, of doing what's best for God. What do they lie about? Uh, well, the big issue, of course, is the, the severity of the corporal punishment. This has taken a step further where other adults, not your parents, are perfectly allowed to paddle a child, just to hit a child. How often did that happen? On a daily basis. A daily basis. Well, it was part of being a member. The parents relinquished their, their ability to have any say in, in their child's rearing. So are children communal property? <laughs> Absolutely. The most difficult aspect of it for me was the feeling of vulnerability and violation. And without being in the community, without being saved in, in prayer, that I was worthless. Hmm. How but long? Did I feel that way? Yeah. My whole life. It's Not something now. I still work. Still? I'm still working to, to you know, recover from and heal. Um, Self-esteem is probably one of my <laughs> my biggest struggles. They tried to break you. I couldn't protect myself, and there was no one else there to protect me. I don't know if you have anything like this, like a, a journal from back then. This is when I was 17, and I'm saying, God, where are you? I wrote, everyone knows me as this bad, insane, stupid person, and they think I'm trash. I might as well go up where all the other trash goes because all I have to give is garbage. It's devastating. I was seven years old when I first decided that I wanted to leave. My father played guitar, and he was one of the musicians for the services that we had, which were every morning and every evening. He had noticed that someone had been fooling around with his guitar. And he kept asking, and this little boy stepped forward and said, I saw her do it. I remember thinking, why would he say that about me? You know, I would, I, I know better than that. And, you know, I'm standing in front of 150 people, and my parents asked me in front of everyone, did you do it? And I, I said, no, I didn't do that. I would never do that. And they said, you're lying. Go to your room. For the next seven days, I was given one meal a day, and I couldn't leave my bed. And every day, a different adult would bring me a plate of food for dinner, and they would say to me, why don't you just tell the truth? I remember praying every day. Saying, God, why can't you just tell them? Why can't you just tell him I am? I am telling the truth. And it just, it didn't understand. They would tell me God spoke to them. God spoke to me today and he told me this. So I said to myself, 
They're all full of <laughs> if, if he really, if they really did hear from God, he would tell them. And after a week, I said, it's all a joke. After that, I said to myself, as soon as I was old enough, I was out. When I was 18 years old, I was at rock bottom. And I was just tired of pretending like I was happy, pretending like I believed in it. It was October 17th, 2005. I remember standing in front of my parents and my uncles and aunts and telling them, I don't know what's out there, but I, I'm gonna go and find out. And my father said, we decided that you're gonna come live with your Ema and I until you get your sanity back. That night, my parents wouldn't let me sleep in my bedroom. They made me sleep on the floor in their room because they were afraid that I would sneak out in the middle of the night when everyone was sleeping. The next morning, my mom had a really bad headache, so she went to lay down for a nap, and my father left the house with my little brother and sister. I remember hugging and kissing them both. I took my little sister by the head, and I said, this is for you. And that was the last time I saw her. And I called my third cousins. I had met them once, and they were my only lifeline. Their daughter answered the phone. She said, I can be there by 5. So I knew there was a coffee shop next to, like, the town commons. So I said to her, I said, meet me in front. And I picked up my backpack and my coat, and I tiptoed out the front door and closed it as quietly as I could. And I started to walk. And then I started to run. I remember hearing in my head my mom yelling my name. And I could hear her heart breaking. I got to where I was supposed to meet my cousin and I saw her car and I ran and jumped in it. I exhaled and I was free. At least that's what I thought. It lasted for three days. And then my older sister, Shalem, convinced me to go to dinner with her. She was my sister, I trusted her. So she picked me up, so I said, where are we going? And she said, your father wants to see you. And I said, I don't want to see him. I have nothing to say to him right now. When I'm ready, I'll, I'll see him. And they said, it's not an option. We started to get further and further away from any buildings or lights or anything. And we started down a dirt road and it was getting dark out. We pulled up. I saw in through the windows into the living room and there was my uncles and my aunts and my dad and all just sitting around waiting for me. I was so scared because I had done something really bad in their mind. And I turned and I ran and I realized I didn't know where I was. There's nowhere to go. They came outside and they said, you're gonna stay with your dad. You'll get your sanity back. You'll learn that this is where you belong. And we stayed in this cottage um, for two months. We would sit and we would talk and we'd fight and he would cry and he would just say, the world is an evil place. And I just would get more and more angry with him. How could he say that? It's not true. I believe there is something else good out there. It felt so good to say how I felt, to just be honest. And he had written me a letter. In the letter, he talks about how I was three years old and I was very sick. I was laying so still, he thought I wasn't breathing anymore. And then he goes on 
in the next paragraph and he says, I know and realize now that it would have been better for you to have died on that night. Not so long ago, than for you to be doing what you're doing today, for you have aligned yourself with the evil one. He disowned me. He said, if you choose to not live my life, then you're not my daughter anymore. And it was that simple for him. My only choice was to run away again. And the next day I was gone. I didn't waste a second. When I left, I separated myself completely from that life. I cut my hair, I changed my name. I changed every single bit about who I was. I turned my back on that life and I felt alone so often. What was your assumed Hebrew name? Batach Yakara. You can see why I changed my name. <laughs> what are some of the things silly or innocuous that you remember from those first days, weeks, and months in the real world? Lipstick. Lipstick. That's a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really know how to do my makeup, and I just, I had this like little infatuation with being able to put color on my lips, and like I felt like I was prettier. Um, shaving. Shaving. That was a really big one. We weren't allowed to shave, so. I remember going to work and there was two girls, they were college students, they were working in the back with me. And I asked them how to get rid of these little red bumps on my legs from, I keep getting them after I shave. And they're like, oh, you mean razor burn? I'm like, oh, there's a word for it. <laughs> there's a term for it. You had never learned any of that. Mm -mm. How many family members did you cut yourself off from that day by running? 40, 50. 50 family members. And the rules were what? You were now shunned? I was disowned. I wasn't part of the family anymore. I wasn't welcome there. 13 years later, I still haven't seen my little brother and sister. 